Ask Twisted. This is Mark McNeese in New York City with my co-host, Rick Rose in Treeport, Louisiana. And you're listening to The Twist. Welcome to another Twist podcast, everybody. This is one of our specials that we're doing now, my co-host Rick Rose and I, where we have on guests to uh, inform you and engage you. And I'm in New York City, as it says in the introduction. Rick, are you in Shreveport this weekend? Uh, I am, and we're in the midst of Mardi Gras last week. We talked about King Cake, as you know, and our guest today is Mark King, who hails from Shreveport as well, originally, Mark. Did you know that, Mark McGee? I, well, I knew that there was a connection because you're also connected by the um, the um, HIV advocates to watch for. Yes, and of course, our last special show featured Sagan Marsh, a thing writer here at the Shreveport Times, who is um, helping me in my mission here. Uh, so Mark King does a wonderful website for those that are tuning in for the first time and haven't heard us talk about Mark before, uh, called My Fabulous Disease. He's a blogger. He does that. You can find him on Facebook or on his website. Tributes a lot to um, various uh, publications and uh, websites, and uh, really active in the community in general. Good morning, Mark King, and thanks for joining us from Baltimore, Maryland. Well, good morning, both of you, Mark and Rick, and thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, uh, I was, and I also know that you spent you spent time lots of places, but um, Los Angeles. I was reading your bio, and you were involved with the Shanti Foundation at one point, and that brought that brought back memories for me from thirty years ago. When I lived in LA. Really? Are you familiar with it? Oh, yes. I lived in Los Angeles from 81 until 93. And that was, you know, that was the the AIDS plague was in yeah. full, full force then. And you had the, you had the, um, the AIDS Project Los Angeles and, and Shanti Foundation. You are absolutely right. And, and, and actually, we lived in Los Angeles at, a, at about the same time. I was there from 80 to 93. And uh, Shanti was the first uh, aid service organization actually to be founded in Los Angeles. And our mission was simply to provide emotional support to people who were dying. Mm -hmm. Because that was all we could do. I mean, this was before meds or anything. So it was a really, you know, obviously an intense time. Yes. Well, I'm very happy to have you on and um, to talk about all of this, so... Yeah, before we get into the meat of the matter, I've got to, I looked at your post last night, Mark, I think it was on your personal Facebook page, and oh my God, you were working out next to Mr. O'Malley the other day, weren't you? <laughs> yes, I was. Well, it turns out that Martin, o, Governor Martin O'Malley, um, he uh, uh, most recently of the Democratic primary, um, but dropped out after Iowa, you know, he has to work out, too, and God knows he does, if anyone's seen pictures of Google pictures of him. <laughs> and uh, he was on the treadmill next to me at the gym here in Baltimore. Uh, and I was, I was such a doofus. I just stared, and I never said anything, and I should have said <laughs> something. And, you know, you know, something insincere, but something, you know. Or gotten, I, I, I thought, should I get a selfie? And I'm like, no, just leave him alone, leave him alone. <laughs> So I, I did not bother him, but let me tell you, the man's eyes are just as blue in person. That's amazing. Did he seem a little down, or was he just right back at it? No, he's, he was just doing his thing. He had a big stack of papers he was reading, you know, while he was uh, <laughs> uh, working out. Um, but um, apparently, for my friends, I have just started going to this particular gym, and it's nothing fancy. But uh, my friends there say, "Oh yeah, he's there all the time." He's not, he's not, you know, modest at all. So that's awesome. Yeah. And Mark McNeese, I was going to ask you, Mark, if you were making the ride to Vermont to uh, feel the burn and get your free uh, Bernie Sanders tattoo. Did you know that was going on? There's a guy doing free tattoos, Mark McNeese, for either of you if you want to drive up north. Well, I am at this point. I mean, O'Malley is not in the race anymore. I'm a Hillary person. And I, at well, sort of by default, which I won't get into. But um, I can't see Hillary's name tattooed on my skin. O'Malley, what's interesting? I'm mean, not O'Malley, but I mean with Bernie. What's so interesting, kind of interesting about him, is he's so popular with the young crowd. I mean, the young folks really love him. It's amazing, mm -hmm. and then they, you know, they coin for Bernie. Are, do you endorse Mark uh, Mark King on your website? Will you endorse a candidate or? Do you think people care who you who you would go for? 
It's not. No, I don't. I don't wade into political waters uh, very often, unless it has to do with some law, you know, or policy that has to do with HIV. Uh, no. Uh, that being said, I'm Hillary all the way. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, as am I. And it's I, I just it a fair. matter of time, people. Everyone just needs to accept. It's just a matter of time. It means you may not get the nomination to this day, but she'll get it. <laughs> She'll get it, and it'll, and and then she will fight every you know inch for it, and she will be the nominee, and uh, hopefully our next president. Totally feel that way as well. It's uh, it's quite amazing. When we were in the green room, folks, those that are listening in, Mark uh, McNeese said, "Ask Mark King." He said, "Hey, thank God, Mark, you watched the Charlie Sheen interview, which was recently on uh, Doctor Oz, and I know Mark, you wrote a whole blog about it." Um, for those that hadn't watched the show or for those that, you know, were, it's so weird that Charlie's thing was hot when it first happened and the choir broke the story, then it went away, now it's kind of back. Is this still relevant? Do you think the discussions that have come from kids coming out, uh, having HIV, is still relevant for us as people? Well, whether we like it or not, it's relevant because it's relevant by, by virtue of the fact that it's all over the television set. Mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 re- it's relevant by definition because people won't stop talking about it. And, and the real shame here is, is that it started out so well, you know, when he initially made his uh, announcement on the Today Show with Matt Lauer, it, it was, I thought, a solid interview. You know, there was a little tiger blood Charlie showing through here and there, his arrogance about, well, HIV is messed with the wrong guy, you know, as if there is a right guy, right? Yeah, but right. he he uh, he did a great job in um, delivering some key messages about what it means to be HIV positive today, particularly having an undetectable viral load and posing no threat to anyone else when you are on successful treatment and your viral load is undetectable. That was, um, you know, suddenly... Uh, I was doing interviews all over the news as uh, as fallout from that, talking about what it means to be undetectable. And, and I, you know, I'll tell you what, two days earlier, never would I have imagined that that would suddenly become a phrase that millions of people were becoming familiar with um, and what it means. So I thought he did a tremendous public service for us in that initial interview. And I just had to cross my fingers that he would hold it together and not get on, go off the rails, um, which he did <laughs> very shortly thereafter when he stops his right. medications and on his quest for a cure finds himself in Mexico while some quack, you know, performs some sort of mysterious treatment that has still not been explained. Um, uh, and, and Charlie claimed that his viral load was uh, undetectable during that time. Well, if he had only recently stopped his medications, his viral load could still be undetectable anyway because the medications were still doing their job. I don't know. But but very soon thereafter, his viral load spiked again, and, and he has gone back on his medications. And this whole sordid ordeal was played out on the Dr. Oz show Um which makes perfect sense when you think about it in terms of, you know, you know the reputation of Dr. Oz and, you know, what, right. what a great arbiter of, you know, scientific research the man is. So, you know, it's been up and down. He had a great start, and then he went off the rails with this, this doctor thing. And unfortunately, you know, as recently as last week, Bill Maher in um, politically, you know, his, his series on HBO – Bill Maher actually sat down with the doctor uh, who had reportedly cured Charlie Sheen of his HIV, which he clearly had not. This guy claims to have cured people with cancer, with HIV. Um, He mentioned he did it with goat's milk. It is insane. And, uh, And yet Bill Maher sat there with a straight face and interviewed the guy because Bill Maher has kind of a little uh, paranoia streak, you know. Uh, he likes government conspiracies. He likes thinking that maybe there's a cure and it's being withheld from us. Um, believe it or not, a guy that's who, who is otherwise, you know, a, a funny comic and um, social critic actually believes that perhaps they're withholding a cure. 
for HIV. And so he, he interviews Charlie's quack doctor, you know, uh, with a straight face. And uh, so that was a great public disservice because in all of this new news about Charlie Sheen seeking a cure, there's no reporting going on about the actual cure research that's happening. Mm-hmm. You know, there are clinical trials going on right now for vaccines. Um, for for cure treatments for people with HIV that are legitimate. And rather than have any of those people on any of those shows, they're focusing on Charlie's pathetic little, you know, effort to go find, you know, some shortcut, you know. Right. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been very, very troubling to, to treatment activists, to HIV advocates of all kinds. Well, something about the whole Charlie Sheen uh, media circus that bothered me was the slut shaming, and then the um, it just kind of I just I just saw a lot of I thought a lot of people were back to HIV is the wages of sin mentality, you know, because he had mm-hmm. li- the lifestyle that he had and the choices that he made. It's oh, okay, Charlie Sheen got HIV, and this is you know this is what happens when you live this way. And I just, yes. I detected an element of that out there, and uh, I thought that was, was pretty unfortunate. I, I agree. I thought that not only was there an element of, oh, well, Charlie Sheen, he had it coming, but not only was it that, that sort of shame thrown for, in his direction, he was throwing it in other people's direction, yeah. uh, particularly in his Today Show interview where he's like, well, you know, he essentially was saying, well, all these slutty girls I've been hanging out with, you know, they're all you know, squeezing me for money. And so I, I'm being forced to do this uh, and, uh, you know, made them look like, you know, in other words, apparently when it comes to HIV, there's all sorts, there's plenty of shame for everyone. You know, we'll just pile it on, you know, one to to another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the other posts you had recently, Mark, going back to O'Malley's Blue Eyes, um, you did a piece about a priest who was real active in the HIV and AIDS community in the early days um, who had piercing blue eyes, and his pictures were amazing. You know, you can look into someone's eyes and, and see their, their past and future. And, and I want to tie it in with, uh, again, I'm verbalizing my gratitude to you for naming me one of the 16 advocates to watch in 2016. And a lot of that has to do with common friends that have me at the Cornette, who's also been a friend on our show, a former Miss America, who still fights the fight. Um, that being said, what I really loved about talking about him is, uh, and really what I loved about your selection of 2016 advocates is there are so many future forwards. The, the disease has changed. The way we're approaching the disease has changed. But when you get back to its core, it really is about compassion and understanding and about that human contact. Um, not to get too emotional because all three of us on the phone have lost so many friends over the years and many listening, of course, have. Um, tell us briefly about that blog and why people should check it out because this man, uh, was really, really poignant to you, too, and uh, made you think about things a little differently, too, didn't he? Of course, oh, he, he certainly did. You know, um, you, you're mentioning two things, and i gotta, and I got to first mention these, this, this list you're talking about, um, the, the Advocates to Watch list, which I guess I'm, I guess I'm putting out every year. And I kind of feel like <laughs> if you're an old queen, you'll remember Mr. Blackwell, you know, would come out with his worst-dressed list every year. And he became kind of a thing. So I think my thing will be I'll come out with the advocates to watch list, which is, of course, more of an honor than being on Mr. Blackwell's worst dress list. But nevertheless, um, I'm I'm enjoying it and and I'm enjoying um, highlighting people who might not otherwise uh, be getting that sort of recognition. And it's the, and, and this year, there were two things I tried to accomplish with that list. I wanted to go worldwide. I wanted to make sure I was really concentrating on people outside the United States who are working in places and advocating in, in, in societies and in political atmospheres in which they are, they are under threat of their own, uh, their own livelihood and their own liberty. Uh, by by the nature of the work they're doing, you know, uh, somewhere in Africa who who was literally on trial for being a homosexual because he was giving uh, safer sex education to uh, 
to people, uh, including gay men. You know, uh, a, a man in um, the Ukraine who was uh, in, under constant threat of prosecution because he was trying to get HIV education and testing in his. So, you know, the stakes are very high when you look around the world. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Rick, I was thrilled to, uh, to not only include you, it was only secondary that I realized that you actually lived in my hometown of Shreveport, so that made it kind of special. Um, but uh, it, it certainly didn't ever figure into the initial thing. I was just happy to uh, highlight your work. So anyway, that, that, uh, that list is something I'm going to look forward to doing, uh, to doing every year. And, um, and it was so nice that the Shreveport Times there in Shreveport did a story about your being on the list because I got this very excited phone call from my mother. <laughs> She's like, Mark, Mark, I'm opening the paper, I'm minding my own business, <laughs> and there is your name. <laughs> I love newspaper. I love so it. It so resonates, yeah. <laughs> It was just, it was great. Um, so, so anyway, the, uh, the, 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 the blog post you're, you're mentioning is, uh, a profile I did of Tom Bondarenko and he, he runs a, a food bank, you know, a food delivery service that initially started for people with HIV and now they do it for people with all life threatening illnesses. And, uh, last month they had me come in and talk to their staff meeting and just, tell my story and talk about early AIDS and stuff because a lot of these staff members are really young. And Tom uh, made a passing reference in, uh, during his comments of, about my uh, remarks uh, by saying that he had once been a priest and, and was, uh, um, and did funerals for the, for the only funeral home in, in Baltimore at the time who would conduct funerals for people lost to AIDS. And, and he got kind of emotional when he mentioned it. He said, I would often be standing at the gravesite alone, conducting the service out loud to no one. And, and that image was so striking to me, and I knew I had to write about it. And so I, I went back to his office a few weeks later and, uh, and sat down and had him tell me the story of how this came to be and, and what it was like to... Um, minister literally to to this was uh as a result of the fact that he was working at a homeless shelter and um uh, you know he in, in the 80s and slowly men started appearing in the homeless shelter who had drug issues and all sorts of things that that were um living with AIDS that were covered in lesions that were clearly very sick and who had no family and who would started to ask Tom because he was a priest, would you conduct my funeral service? And Tom would often try to get to locate family of any kind, and either he couldn't or they wouldn't uh, show up. And, and he talked to me about what it was like to conduct the funeral service to the grass and the trees and the lonely graveyard with no one there, but how he did it out loud because he felt like that was what was proper and he wanted to, to do it respectfully and it was just a heartbreaking story and uh and he had a very difficult time talking about it without crying you know mm -hmm. he just filled with tears several times during that conversation but it was such a lovely um snapshot of what we all did uh in our own ways during that time uh, and just a lovely bit of grace and uh, that he that he demonstrated, and uh, um, we don't want to forget that. We want we want to keep those stories alive and let people know, um, you know what lengths, what courage, you know what what personal fortitude um, so many of us displayed. Well, I think that uh, it's very moving. I'm sitting here being very emotional because it seems like. And I could be wrong. I'm not. I'm definitely not somebody who lives in the past. I'm 57, and I'm very much alive, and you know, try to be vibrant, and all of those things. But it just seems like what we as a generation went through is fading in relevance to younger people. They've got cocktails. They've got prep. They, you know, and they, they just. I don't know. I don't know where I'm trying. What I'm trying to say. I just. It does need to be 
not only kept alive, but the the absolute power of it remembered because yes. it's not, you know, it's, I sometimes feel it's not, you know, it's like, and I, I don't want to be tangential, but being a gay man is sort of becoming in some quarters, I just feel marginalized. I feel like I'm the, I'm just like this old gay man and who doesn't matter anymore. And I don't know why, where I'm getting that, those feelings, but when I read things, you know, the queer kids and all of this stuff, it's like, oh, you're just, you know, you're just a gay man and blah, 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 blah. So um, I hope that I hope that there, you know, some of the the generation uh, that's you know that's current and and future generations will remember that this was profound. I mean, this was a profound I, thing to experience. I think, Mark, uh, what what touched me this week in the news was the AIDS pill going digital. That story this week really moved me because, as we all know, um, the three of us talking, those listening, and that can relate to. The, the last five or ten minute conversation here, um, the quilt really symbolized and represented so much of what was going on and, and just sewing it and touching it and feeling it. And I know when Charles died, my partner, um, grabbing his ties, his Hermes ties, or you know, now I'm getting emotional, but the smell of the tie when he was working at Christian Dior and blah, 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 and putting that together. And I just, it's so reflective that the last display, of course, Mark McNeese, you and I were there to see when they unfurled it uh, in Washington, yeah. Time or, and Washington or Lanza and I, when we were reading names, you know, and now it's gone digital. So we say, you know, like Mark King, you were referring to the Street Times, and now my whole mission working at the Times is really to take things digital. But I, I think that will have some resonance, Mark, uh, Mark and Mark. I really hope that the quilt coming back and going digital and kind of promoting that story, people can look up, you know, histories and stuff. I really, I do hope it has some resonance. On the other hand, when you have someone like Sagan Marsh working at the paper, who's a young 22-year-old from Indiana who's really... Now she's doing, Mark King, you should know she's working with Chip over at the Philadelphia Center to do a story about prep and the husband and wife here locally who are on prep. Those are the conversations that need to happen. So I think Mark McNeese, you know, we live in the one world, but on the other end, we have to really promote and support and love that other world that's, you know, going forward. I, that's my thoughts on it. Um, Mark King, any ideas you have? Well, I'm of two minds. I, I absolutely agree with Mark that this is, in, that this is precious history to be preserved. What it is, you know, I'm 55 years old. What I experienced in the 20s, uh, in my 20s, uh, in the, during the 1980s, was profound and uh, certainly the greatest health crisis of the century. And uh, it was um, also a, an opportunity to see the very best of people, as tragic as it was. So. You know, people are going to be writing about it and creating art uh, uh, about um, AIDS and, and particularly its impact in the 1980s for the rest of time. It is going to be, uh, it's going to be a marker for the rest of time. How did, what happened, how did people respond, both good and bad? It's going to be something that we're mulling over for a long time, and that is the way it should be. That being said... Um, I also have to seed history to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And I have to remember that this is a very human condition that um, a gen as a generation ages, we step aside. We are not as relevant. We are no longer in the spotlight in the way that we were. Our time in the spotlight was filled with great tragedy. And, and it probably has more resonance um, than most generation's time in the spotlight. But I have to remember that I, I will often say, you know, I did not, in my youth, I did not walk up to Vietnam vets and say, tell me all about it. Mm -hmm. Please, let's sit down. I want to hear all about your experience. I didn't do that. I was, I was self-absorbed. You know, I was self-centered. I was in my own youth. I was, I was having my own experience. And, uh, um, and now that's what this younger generation is doing. I don't believe, I certainly believe that they are informed mm -hmm. by what has happened to us, but they have to, they have to make their own way. You know, I, um, I, I do my best to, to provide opportunities for them to hear about our history. Um, but I also have to have the humility to understand that they are having their own experience. They are having their own prime. 
you know, of life in youth. And, um, and they'll have to make their own mistakes. Um, and, uh, and, and the best I can do is provide as much mentorship and guidance and reflection on my own history as I can, but that only goes so far. Because, because again, they're too busy living their life to, to want to, uh, you know, hear too much about what I, what happened to me 30 years ago. That's very interesting. There were, uh, I want to bring up two things. And one, one of those two movies that recently I saw here in Shreveport, and of course they're playing in Baltimore, they're playing in New York, they're playing all over. One is on Anomalisa, which is a puppet uh, movie done by Charlie Kaufman, who did adaptation and some very powerful movies. And it's really just about that. You know, life goes on. It's, uh, it's just about a guy that's a speaker at a conference and falls for a woman that's got her own uniqueness, um, although she views herself as very bland. And then last night I saw a movie Youth with Michael Caine. And um, it's a very beautiful, uh, imagery-rich movie. And um, it's about an old conductor and an old film writer. And Jane Fonda, of course, plays an old actress. And it's a beautiful movie, gentlemen. I don't Have either of you seen it yet? No. I've seen both. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> because I am, a, I am a movie queen, so I see everything. And you're right. Um, they're both brilliant in their own way, especially Animal Lisa. Yeah, and they resonate the conversation we're having here. And our experience, you know, uh, it is what we were given, uh, centers around the plague and, and all of that. That's what defined us. But everybody, my mom's experience, that she's a 74-year-old woman, is very different, and I'm sure she fe- feels the same way about her story. You know, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And then secondly, I want to bring this back as we wrap this up. Um, my work with the AIDS Master, one of the things we used to always do is focus back on the time before AIDS and HIV. And we really looked at, hey, remember when, you know, uh, things were different. And I want to just kind of focus on that, Mark, and then we'll wrap it up. And the reason I bring it up is because Mark McNeese promised we'd talk about this. You and I also share a history because we were both contestants on a game show. And I want to reflect on that. I mean, you were on The Price is Right when you were a, a young 20-some-year-old kid. I was 19, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I saw the clip because you were kind enough to share it with me. Boy, such energy you brought to that stage. <laughs> did you come on down? Uh, I did. I went on down, and I won a car. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, yes, it was great. Yeah. It was just gr- great to see, you know, you in that space. And So is that a memory of a lifetime for you as well? Well, it, it is, and and I think it is. Especially, I actually you I actually talk about that experience uh, in the prologue of my book, A Place Like This, which um, chronicles my my time in Los Angeles, um, because it was my introduction to Los Angeles, going out there and getting on this game show, and and I and because it is on tape, because it's on YouTube, and I can look at it again, and it and it brings back it brings back to me um, the uh, a life filled with possibilities. This young, fresh face, where his whole life was ahead of him, and nothing bad had happened yet. And I had a boyfriend, and life was good, and I was moving to Los Angeles, and all of this stuff, you know, was ahead of me, with no clue of of. Uh, you know, the darkness that was about to descend on all on all of us there, uh, especially in Los Angeles. And so it is absolutely a milestone for me for some bittersweet reasons. You know, I look at that face and it is um, untouched, as yet untouched, by what was a prof- what was going to be a profound tragedy that would that would haunt me the rest of my life. So yes, it's it's interesting to watch. Mm. And my experience was the same. I remember when I was on stage at class of concentration and I was there with, you know, I still have that video or my niece and nephew do, and they, they swear to pull it out every time I bring friends home to Wisconsin. But um, Charles was on stage with me, you know, and then, um, yeah, he had HIV at the time, but the the, 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 the other issues all happened after that. So, yeah, it's uh, quite the thing. So, Mark, tell people how they can follow you or find you and, um, where you where you would like to direct them if they haven't read your work before? Oh sure. Um, well, people are welcome to come visit me on my blog. It's it's myfabulousdisease.com. dot com, and um, you know from there I'm on Twitter at myfabdisease. Um, but uh, my website is really kind of my home base for most of my writings and videos, and uh, and they are welcome to come by. 
Well, Mark, it's been a delight to have you on and talk to you. You're in Baltimore. I like Baltimore. We have friends there. Been there quite a few times. And um, to just get your um, your take on all these things, it's been really nice. You're so welcome. I I'm, I, I appreciate the invitation very much. Um, thanks thanks to both of you. Absolutely. And I want to mention that we have um, our next guest. We're currently doing these once a month. Because we also we normally it's Rick and I and our our just our craziness on um on the weekends, but once a month we have a guest, and our next guest is Beverly Pomeranz, and uh, she's coming up there in March. I also want to say thank you to the Pride Forty Eight podcasting community. The Twist is now on their roster, so you can find us at thetwistpodcast.com. dot com. You can um. Check us out on iTunes, Libsyn, Stitcher, and now Pride Forty Eight. So, yes. Rick, Rick, I know you're gonna you you've got. I call them in quotes. I always thought that was kind of. Um, I don't I clever. Like I, I don't try to be clever, but I like it. I mean, I like. <laughs> I like it too, and uh, yeah, I'm grateful uh, for the podcast for getting out there in other ways. And that Pomeranz, it's it's a unique theme because Fabian March was our first special guest, and Mark King, and thank you again, Mark for joining us. And then Beth Pomerantz is actually the one that cast me on uh, Class of Concentration. So there's like this continuing thread, Mark and Mark, that's kind of like our guests are all kind of twisted and connected in some ways. But yes, here's our end quote for the day. Um, the movie on, on Mona Lisa actually led me to this quote only because I was digging into the meaning of that movie. And this is from um, child development psychologist R. L. R. Knopf is his name, and it is this quote. Life is amazing, and then it's awful. And then it's amazing again. And in between the amazing and the awful, it's ordinary and mundane and routine. Breathe in the amazing, hold on through the awful, and relax and exhale during the ordinary. That's just living. Heartbreaking, soul-healing, amazing, awful, ordinary life. And it's breathtakingly beautiful. That's our end quote. End quote. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, for everybody, the listeners, to uh, for tuning into the Twist, America's Only clothing optional podcast.